Uh, I'm Kumar Murthy, I'm the director of the Field Institute, and welcome to this COVID-19 math modeling seminar. Uh, today our speaker is David Champrezon from Western University, and he'll speak on the challenges of daily forecasts of COVID-19 cases in Ontario. David, please. Hello, hi, good morning everyone. So my name is David Champrezon. I'm at Western University, I'm a postdoc over there. And um, first I would like to thank the organizers um, for inviting me today and to share my experience in forecasting um, the COVID-19 cases in Ontario. So, um, and before starting this talk, I would like to uh, make a few acknowledgements. Um, so my funding comes from Western University and in particular from uh, Art Prune's uh, lab. And Art has been very supportive with this uh, forecasting project, uh, even if it's not completely aligned with the work I am supposed to do in this lab. Um, so then I would like to mention uh, that any of this forecasting uh, work that I've done wouldn't have been possible without the, the, the hard work that uh, Mike Lee, who's also uh, a postdoc at McMaster University, uh, put into curating and cleaning uh, the COVID-19 data for Canada. So if you work, I mean, if you need to work on COVID data for Canada, it's, it's probably uh, worth that you check out uh, his GitHub pages that I've put it here. Um, and then finally, I, I've benefited a lot from uh, discussions with, with various people, but here in particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, the discussions I had with, with Ben Bolker, Jonathan Duchoff, and David Earn uh, from McMaster University, and also with uh, Kevin Brown, who's an epidemiologist at uh, Public Health Ontario. Okay, so, um, I know we are in the middle of, of this pandemic and uh, you may have seen uh, a timeline like this already, but it will help me frame chronologi chronologically this talk. So um, in Ontario, the first case was reported in January 25th um, and, it take, it, and it took about a, a month to have the fourth case reported. And um, it then, more or less a month later, we had, so on March 17th, we had the first death. Uh, and at that time, we had already 189 cases. And on the very same day, uh, the state of emergency was declared in Ontario. And about um, uh, two weeks later, uh, the, I mean, the, uh, the province of Ontario uh, released some modeling projections. And among, among them, were um, projections for death. And the, at the time, on April 3rd, they forecasted uh, that there will be about uh, 1,600 deaths by April 30th. And when, when you go uh, further in time, and specifically on April 30th, you had uh, 1,082 deaths reported. So not that you know, uh, of the projections that were made about a month ago. And we had already about 16,000 cases and already uh, 277,000 277, tests are done. And so we are today on May 5th, and we are talking about, um, um, like many other provinces in Canada, we start to talk about relaxation of the social distancing uh, measures that have been put in place uh, on March 17th. Um, so I... Um, Along this timeline, I, I display my own model development timeline. Uh, and so as you can see, uh, three models have been developed and I'm going to describe them. Um, there was the first one that I will call a latent model that I've abandoned for, I mean, after working on it about, for about 10 days. Then I will talk about the, the actual, I mean, the forecasting model that I've used to produce a daily forecast of COVID-19 cases in Ontario. And my first um, forecast was released on March 31st. And then there is a third model that I'm currently developing, which is more uh, geared towards um, monitoring uh, the, the, the relaxation of social distancing. So um, before going into the details of, of those models, I need to introduce uh, the, the renewal equation uh, framework. So, um, most of the of epidemiological models uh, that we encounter in, to, in the literature fall into three categories. 
Um, and I've, here I've just displayed them in complexity order. Uh, so you have uh, the phenomenological models, so very simple models where basically it's fitting a, a mathematical curve to the points that are uh, observation. And a typical example is trying to fit a logistic curve to uh, the cumul the, um, the cumul count, the cumulative count of, of cases, for example. So these models are very simple, but there is no mechanistic uh, process built in, in, in those, in those phenomen phenomenological models. Then, of course, we have uh, the, 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 the framework of ordinary differential equations with uh, you know, the very famous SEIR type of models. And then we have agent-based models, which are uh, usually more complex because they try to um, uh, model uh, you know, in greater details what's going on, uh, in, whether in the epidemics or in hospitals or in the community and so on. Um, so there is a, another framework which is really rarely used, uh, which is based on the Renewal equation that I'm going to, to describe in the next slide. And this, this framework fits, I think, really uh, neatly between uh, very, very simple models. Uh, so the Renewal equation, as you will see, is a relatively simple framework, but it's still mechanistic. So what I mean by mechanistic, it, it, you, you have uh, built in this model um, uh, a process to uh, describe the disease transmission in a population, okay? unlike the phenomenological model. And still, I mean, you may argue about simplicity or not, but um, it, it remains relatively simple. And at least from what I'm going to describe today, I rank that slightly uh, below what we used to do with the compartmental model in, in differential equations in terms of complexity. So um, the, we, we can trace back the renewal equation to the 18th century from the work made by Euler. Um, and more relevant to epidemic modeling, uh, Kermack and McKendrick did use the renewal equation in their seminal paper on, on epidemic modeling in 1927. So it, this is not new at all. So what is the renewal equation? It's um, uh, basically, you, it describes how cohort of infectious individuals uh, spread their infectiousness over time. So you have uh, the, uh, uh, the equation on the, on the right-hand side here, where the incidence at time t is uh, modeled as the sum of the incidence that has been spreaded um, by a past cohort. So i of t minus tau are the past cohort. And the way this infectiousness spreads over time is a model with the generation interval distribution. So the generation interval is the interval of time between the moment an individual is infected and the time when this infector generates a secondary case by infecting an individual. Okay, so it's just a generation of infections. And the intensity of the transmission is modeled with the basic reproduction number here. So um, in, in terms of epidemiological modeling, uh, well, we need to include uh, the susceptible depletion, depletion, which here is, is modeled very simply by just saying that the rate of depletion is simply the, the incidence uh, that you observe, let's say, every day. So, uh, so that's you know, the, the renewal equation that I'm going to talk about for the next few slides. And it's actually very, uh, I mean, it's, it's, this renewal equation is the basis of the very popular equation um, to estimate the effective uh, reproduction number R, okay? the, the Wallinger-Lipschitz um, uh, uh, equation or paper. Uh, and also, you know, the, 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 the package which is now seems to be relatively uh, popular uh, among epidemiologists, the PS team, uh, relies on this, on this um, type of, of equation. Um, so why, why using the renewal equation for um, uh, disease modeling? I mean, uh, infectious disease uh, spread. 
modeling. Well, first you have a natural uh, way to uh, describe, I mean, you have, you have a ver discrete time version, which is you know, easily translated from the continuous time I just showed you. And especially in the early phase of the outbreak, uh, we want to um, forecast, I mean, the focus is really on incidence. And this, uh, you know, this, this modeling framework is uh, really focused on incidence. We just described the incidence here. And so it's a very convenient uh, framework if your focus is only on incidence. And it's convenient and simple. So, um, I'm, I'm pro, I mean, some, somehow here you can see that I'm promoting uh, the, the renewable equation, but because it is so rarely used uh, in epidemic modeling, it is fair to ask um, how does that compare to the gold standard of the SEIR models, right? The, the compartmental models. And well, in fact, um, they are equivalent. So this equivalence uh, between delay integral equation and ODEs is well known since the 1960s. So we have mathematical biologists like Dickman and Metz who, who have you know, uh, uh, used that and, is, and, and, and stated that you know, there, there is an equivalence. Uh, the only uh, problem that I mean, we had until recently was you know, how can we explicitly for, go from one to another? And that's what um, with, with David and Jonathan Dushoff, we explicitly uh, derive expression for the generation interval uh, distribution, G, such that you know, by picking the right formulation for G, the, the right function, you have exactly, uh, I mean, you, have an, you have an equivalence between compartmental SIR model, SEIR model, sorry, with the renewal equation. So here, I mean, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I just want to point out that uh, we have the comfort that to, to know, I mean, it's maybe more like a philosophical comfort, uh, that when we use the renewal equation, somehow we are doing more or less exactly what a, a SEIR model can do. Okay, it's just uh, uh, the way it's, it's stated that it's slightly different. So now I'm going to, uh, so now that I've you know, defined the renewal equation, I can introduce uh, the forecasting models that I've, I've been using. So during the early phase of the outbreak, uh, the incidence observed was uh, only based on uh, reported positive PCR tests. So the PCR tests are tests, a molecular test that um, can assess whether or not uh, an individual is currently infected with, um, uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And initially, um, in Ontario, until about mid-March, uh, the, the, the testing reports were not available on a daily basis. And uh, as, as, many, as many of you know, um, you know, having missing data is, is, is an issue. Um, so, I mean, and especially when you have a substantial amount of missing data, that can be problematic. So what I've decided to do is, oops, sorry, to, um, is to use what I call a latent model to fill in this, this missing data. And one of the reasons I use the latent model, it's first because, well, it's designed for that, but also I had already uh, uh, this kind of model, more or less really to use uh, from the forecasting work I did for seasonal influenza in Ontario um, a, a year ago. So the latent model has a hierarchical structure where at the top uh, we have the true incidence. So the true incidence which is not observed. So I of t is the incidence uh, observed on day A, on day t. And you see that um, it's driven by the renewal equation here that I have, okay? And um, what, what I do is that, I mean, what we, we make incidence a random variable. And here, you know, I just chose a Poisson distribution 
to reflect the stochasticity of the transmission process. Okay, so for the true incidence that I do not observe, uh, but which is my latent variable, uh, I use the Reynolds equation with within a stochastic framework. Okay, so the uh, so the Reynolds equations are these two first equations here. Then I introduce uh, another variable which uh, represent the total tests done daily okay and i simply assume that the number of tests that were performed daily is a fraction of the true incidence with a time lag and again because we have now uh, uh, an, this is an observation process which is imperfect okay we don't uh, we don't observe exactly, let's say, 20% of incidents every day. So I add, again, a, a Poisson distribution around this, this mean uh, value. For the positive tests, oh, and the positive, the positive tests that would be published daily, if they were published, um, again, a very simple assumption that it's, it's a constant fraction of the total test done. And again, uh, this is, uh, there is an, an observation process on top of that, I mean, an observation uh, uncertainty. So this is why I have the Poisson distribution here. So all these variables are not observed. So that's why I call them latent or they are called latent. What I do observe are the reported tests on, on day K that, that are reported uh, irregularly. So, uh, R of K um, here represent the, the dates of the report. And conceptually, so if I had a report on day three and now I have a report on day 10, um, my, the number I see on day, uh, on day 10 is the sum of the test, uh, the test on daily for days four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so this is basically what I'm saying here. And for the reported positive tests, it's exactly the same. Okay. So our, observa our observations are the values for U and, and Y here. So these reported um, uh, tests that are not necessarily daily uh, form the, the data that will be used to infer uh, within a Bayesian statistical inference uh, framework uh, my latent variable, okay? And in part, I mean, as a technical side note, I use Hamiltonian uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this is the kind of output that this kind of model, um, latent model gives you. So, <clears throat> sorry, on the, the step lines are, I mean, represent the data. So uh, the blue line here represents um, the, the, um, the reported positive test. So you can see that, you know, uh, the points are irregularly spaced. So it means that the reporting was not done regularly. So I had 35 uh, tests performed on a given day. So it was on the 25th of February, then, you know, five, uh, four days later, 97 tests and so on. Uh, same thing with the step um, line here uh, in red, which shows the reported positive tests. So this um, statistical framework of the latent model uh, gives me the, 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 the distribution of those uh, variables that I do not observe. So for example, here, all these distribution here are the distribution for each day of what could have been uh, the, the total number of tests, okay? So that, uh, so this is for the total number of tests, um, this is for uh, the uh, total number of positive tests, and then I have uh, my true uh, incidence, that is here. Um, so the, that inference enabled me to uh, fill in the gaps, right? and then have a clean uh, uh, time series to, to feed in the model, which then can forecast by simulating forward. Okay, so if I were to forecast uh, at, that, at that day around you know, end of February, I would, um, uh, no, it's actually not end of February, sorry. 
uh, but let's say, uh, yes, about 30 days later, 30 days after uh, February 20, then uh, I would fill in this distribution as you know, latent data and then simulate for what to, uh, to do my projections. Okay, so the pictures I've just uh, shown you is, is uh, you know, pretty and the model behaved relatively well for the early phase of the outbreak. And then I started to run into issues with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo convergence. Uh, and I suspect, I didn't really have the time to inv investigate that, but I suspect that my, uh, my model was inconsistent with data. You know, it was a relatively simple data uh, model, sorry. And I, and I um, ended up uh, spending most of my time solving you know, purely technical issues with this uh, MCMC convergence. So, um, and moreover, um, the testing report were consistently published daily. So the need for daily latent variables was less and less relevant. Um, so you know, filling the gaps, as I showed you, was not really um, that much of a priority. So what I've decided is to switch to a simpler model that would give me less headaches with uh, you know, uh, MCMC convergence. So I abandoned this model and no forecast was produced, um, I, don't, I mean, was sent, were sent out. I did produce some forecasts, but it was just for me and, and, and I was more debugging the model than anything else. But, okay, so now I'm going to move on to uh, the actual, um, uh, to describe the actual modeling forecast that I have been using to produce uh, the daily forecast of COVID cases in Ontario. So it's a, co it's a close cousin uh, to the latent model I've just described. And in particular, it's still based on the renewal equation. So to give an overview, uh, I wanted to keep the renewal equation because it's simple and it's a convenient framework for forecasting and including you know, uh, uncertainty in, into the model. I removed the daily latent variables and I made you know, one very bold assumption, which is to take uh, the tests, so the positive tests reported, that's at what I call it face value. So I just assume that you know, they are proportional to, to the true incidence. I wanted to, to um, uh, include in the, in, in the model hospitalization, critical case, and uh, death, because they are you know, probably the most important outcomes. I also wanted to uh, include social distancing into, in the model, because it was evident uh, by the time I was you know, developing this, this new model, so it was in mid-March, that the social distancing measures would have an effect on the transmission rate. And finally, um, I, I used um, you know, another method, so it's a technical note here, and it's a side note, but I used an, an approximate uh, Bayesian computation uh, algorithm to fit the model and not an MCMC um, anymore because I mean, in my opinion, it's easier to work with. Uh, it's much less efficient than uh, a Markov chain Monte Carlo, but um, it could do a decent job at estimating param parameters. So, and it was, again, it was easier to work with for me. So, um, this model uh, takes into account two sources of uncertainties. So we have uh, the observation, model and the transmission model. So I still have my uh, true incidence. This is a latent variable, okay? So I, I, I don't observe it. I just try to imagine, I mean, I, I imagine. I let the, the, the model infer what it could be under the, the sets of assumptions I'm making. So here, uh, when you look at, uh, at uh, this ratio here, it's, it translates what I've just said in the, in, in the previous slide. I take the positive, uh, the report of positive tests at face value. So I assume that the true incidence is going to be proportional to, to the number of, of reported positive tests. So I simply take the number of positive tests with a lag and I divide by the reporting rate. So I'm just not doing uh, uh, that in a deterministic way, but again, I'm um, uh, 
adding a layer of uh, a stochastic layer, and here it's a gamma distribution, to reflect that the observation and the, the reporting uh, are, are, I mean, there are some, some noise around that. Um, the, uh, so I parameterize the gamma with, I mean, I, I just don't use the, the, the standard parameterization with the shape and, and rate, but more like the mean, so it's easier to, to understand. And um, the coefficient of variation, which is just the standard deviation divided by the mean, I just fixed it to a, a value at 0 0.2. I don't really try to, uh, to fit that because I'm not too sure how I would do it. I, I don't really have the data, I think. So, so yeah, so that's the observation model that allow me to infer what is the true uh, incidence uh, uh, that is going, I mean, of this epidemic. And then I have my transmission model. So my transmission model, um, again, is driven by the renal equation. It has also um, the stochastic layer to translate, to translate sorry, the, the randomness of the transmission process. Again, I'm using the gamma distribution. And, and the choice of the distribution is, is really arbitrary, and, and, and we cannot do about that. Um, so the distribution is centered around the, you know, the, 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 the deterministic value of the renewal equation. Uh, so it's the renewal equation which is slightly modified here. Um, so um, I've added, um, so the, 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 the ratio of susceptible divided by the total number of the population is as an exponent now, and I call this uh, parameter, it's kind of a trick um, to um, uh, model the fact that the social distancing has likely changed our contact network. So, and made it less homogeneous. Okay, we are all at home, we are contacting only uh, you know, our close you know, household. Or, uh, so uh, this, is, this parameter alpha is what I call the contact heterogeneity parameter. Uh, the um, uh, generation interval distribution, which uh, you know, models how the, the, the disease is spread over time, uh, is based on the serial interval that have been published uh, you know, in the literature. So here again, it's kind of a bold assumption um, to, to say that this uh, serial interval is the same as the generation interval. So the difference between uh, the generation interval and the serial interval, um, the generation interval look at the difference in time between infections, but usually we don't observe infections. Uh, Whereas the serial interval look at the difference in time where you have symptoms onset, so these this is observable, but you know these two these two distributions are not necessarily the same. So again, I mean that's 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 an assumption. And then one important change that I've made to uh, the renal equation I've presented earlier is that I've included a multiplicative factor um, in front of uh, the basic reproduction number R zero which is uh, here to model uh, the, the behavior change. So it's going to be a function that uh, depends on time, and I'm going to, to describe it in the next slide. Um, and when I say it's fixed and fitted, so I'm going to fix the shape, but I'm going to fit some uh, parameters uh, that uh, define the shape of the function B of t. So B of t really stands for the behavior change. Uh, uh, caused by the social distancing. So I have three scenarios. And so the three figures you see here are the three um, uh, definitions for uh, uh, the function B of T, for the behavior function, uh, under these three scenarios. So there is one that I call baseline, so which probably the word was relevant at the time. Now I think it's, it's a bit misleading, but baseline means nothing has changed. So it's like as if there was, there wouldn't have been any social distancing at all. Okay, so the, uh, the, the behavior hasn't changed and stays at one. So you know, we multiply the initial um, basic reproduction number by one, so it doesn't change. Um, isolation one, ISO one, is more like what we are uh, right now. So, it, it was one until uh, March 20th, about the time where we, uh, this, the state of emergency was um, 
was declared in Ontario, and then when people started to really distance themselves from, you know, from work, from uh, the, the school were closed, and so on. So here, it's a very simple assumption that uh, uh, you know, the contact rate dropped suddenly uh, by an amount lambda, okay? And then stays as it, you know, constant forever. And then you have uh, another scenario, which is not the one we are in yet, but we will probably be in soon, where uh, it's, so it's called isolation two, ISO two, where it's similar to ISO one. So we have this drop on March 20th that represents uh, you know, the, the shutdown, the lockdown of, of, of the economy, I mean, of, of our society here in Ontario. And then, so that, I mean, I, I just designed this, I mean, I designed this isolation two scenario, um, I mean, a while ago. So I imagine that by May 15th, we will probably start to uh, ease uh, the social distancing and maybe go back to more or less normal uh, by July 15th. Okay, so these are just hypothetical dates that I picked uh, a month ago. Okay, so these are my three scenarios uh, that are modeled with this function, with this behavioral function B of T. Okay, so um, I have my model. I have my data you know, from the reports uh, that are published every day from, from uh, you know, the Ministry of Ontario. So I run my ABC fit, and because it's a, it's a Bayesian framework, uh, that gives me posterior distribution for my model parameters. And then I can simulate forward in time uh, the, the true latent incidence that I do not observe, I of t. And when I simulate that forward, then I go back um, again using my very simple observation model by assuming that the future uh, positive tests are going to be simply um, uh, a proportion of the true incidence that, that has been simulated for one in time. Okay? So that makes the basis of, of, of the forecasts. And again, you know, I include, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same as, as the, the, the slide I showed earlier. Um, we have a gamma distribution to translate the fact that the observation is noisy. I want to implement also the severity cascade, I call the severity cascade, which is you have positive tests and then a proportion of these individuals are going to be hospitalized. From those who are hospitalized, some of them are going to be in ICUs and unfortunately, uh, another proportion uh, is going uh, to die. So I implement this severity cascade re relatively simply. I just assume that, um, so H of T is uh, the number of hospital admission on day T. I just assume that uh, that's uh, uh, proportional to the number of positive tests that were reported um, uh, with the time lag. And it's just a number here, H. So H is, I mean, if you want, it's fitted on the data, but it's, it's not really part of the ABC. I don't, I, I don't include that into the, um, uh, the fitting procedure. I just read the value of H out of the, 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 the daily reports. So the value was about 12%. Okay, I was just simply doing the ratio of uh, number of hospitalized um, divided by the number of positive tests that were reported, um, let's say, 11 days ago. And I do, a, and, and again, I add a probability distribution to reflect that this is a stochastic process. Okay, we don't have exactly a, a fixed proportion of of the of the positive tests. I do the same for critical cases. So I, you know, from the hospitalized um, uh, uh, reporting number, I have a fixed number that I read out of the reports. And again, a Poisson distribution. For the death, exactly the same thing, except that, so at the beginning, I had only a, a, a parameter here, the D, which symbolized the fraction of the people who are in critical care who are going to die. But then I had uh, some difficulties to fit uh, the, the death time series. 
And I had to include this, what I call this fudge factor, because it's really a fudge. I'm just fudging with, with the fit here um, to try to improve uh, slightly the, 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 the fit on the depth data. And I, I mean, this parameter epsilon here, I try to, to keep it close to zero. I don't want that, um, that fudge factor to have too much of an influence on, on the overall uh, forecast. But I, I thought I would just mention that because it, it, came, it, came, it came in later and I'm still having some, some, some issues with fitting the depth for, for, for some reason. Um, so to summarize, um, this, this forecasting model is, is, is uh, based on, I mean, the transmission is based on the renewal equation. Uh, the severity cascade is uh, relatively, you know, uh, simple in the way it's implemented. Uh, what's, what was important for me is really to include the sources of uncertainty. So both for the observation and the transmission process and to propagate this uncertainty into the forecast. And that's where I find the renewal equation, which is relatively convenient um, to do that. And you can, of course, argue that you can also do that with, with the ODEs. And, and, and transform this uh, ordinary, differential, ordinary differential equation into stochastic differential equation. And that's, I mean, for sure it's doable and so on. I, I just found, I mean, for my, um, uh, for my convenience that the renewal equation was, was relatively well adapted for that. Um, and one important point for me is that the forecast should really um, translate our, our level of uncertainty uh, rather than just showing a point estimate. And this is what you know, the, 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 the forecasting report that I produced out of the outputs of this model try to highlight. So this is what I'm going um, to show in the, in the, in the next uh, part of this talk, um, you know, these reports. I just want to mention briefly that um, the, the forecasting model is on GitHub. So, you know, for, so it's, it's for sure it's not as, as clean and, and as tidy as I would like it to be, but I, but I thought I would put that on GitHub just for the sake of transparency. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the, the forecasting report um, that are produced out of this forecasting model. So um, the goal of the forecasting report uh, were really to provide a high level summary of, of what the, the model, of the output of the model. So a lot has been digested. Uh, and I wanted also to emphasize on the main outcomes, which were the total burden, what is the total number of deaths we can expect, uh, the peak values and the peak time. What was also very important uh, for me was to translate all these, these output into probability, probabilistic outcomes. And again, this is to emphasize on the intrinsic uncertainty we have when we try to forecast uh, epidemic trajectories. Uh, and so these, um, this report, uh, I mean, the forecasts are based on the three scenarios, okay? The baseline, isolation one and the isolation two, that I've defined earlier, I mean, in the previous slides with the function, uh, the behavior function, B of T. So before presenting the projection about future incidents, it is possible to estimate uh, the impact of social distancing. So if you remember, the, uh, the scenario isolation one has this, uh, so you have the behavior function that has this, this profile here, okay? A sudden drop in the contact rate. And the, the, the parameter lambda, which, which uh, represents this drop in the contact rate, is actually um, uh, no, uh, free. So I can fit it to the, to the data. I've just fixed uh, the date, so I don't move the date. So I just assume uh, that it, you know, the drop happens on March 20th. And because I'm in, um, I'm in a Bayesian framework, uh, lambda is going to be uh, inferred through uh, a posterior distribution. So this is what I have here. So this is, I mean, this, uh, I mean, 
the, the shape of BT and the posterior and prior distribution are, are not going into the report. Okay, so this is just for, for this talk here. Um, what I wanted to I mean, go in, uh, in a little bit of, of details uh, here is that my prior on, uh, on the parameter lambda, so on the drop of the contact rate, is completely uniform between 0 and 100%. And you know, after the, the fit, uh, we see that the, um, uh, we can see that there is some kind of a clear signal for I mean, clear signal. The, the posterior dis distribution is is identified for this this drop. Okay, and what I report is uh, just summary statistics on this posterior distribution. Okay, so that's that's the first step is being able to see I mean to try to assess what's the impact of social distancing. Uh, on the transmission rate. Um, and then I, uh, I move on to the, the actual projection, uh, starting with the total burden of the epidemic. So uh, the panels, so this is actually taken from, I mean, the figure taken from the report. Um, the panels in the top row are the posterior uh, distributions of um, the critical number of cases, the number of deaths, the number of, of hospitalizations. So for example, if I focus on the number of deaths here, um, the, these, these, these segments here, these bars, uh, represent uh, the 80 and 95 uh, credible intervals of the posterior distribution of the cumulative number of deaths for each scenario here. Okay, and, and, and the, the points uh, represent the mean. So, this is what I was uh, saying earlier, is that I, I really you know, summarize uh, a little bit to the extreme and try to digest all this uncertainty and I try to represent it uh, you know, as clearly as possible. So here, uh, let's say for uh, the um, uh, scenario ISO, isolation one, you know, the number of deaths can range between, let's say, 2,000 to uh, 17,000. I think that's the most important message uh, for the, I mean, at least for, from my point of view, for the forecasts, um, and rather than having really a point estimate. And then the, the panels in the bottom row are simple probabilistic outcome extracted from the distribution above. So again, if I focus on uh, the, the cumulative number of deaths under the scenario uh, isolation one, what is the probability that the cumulative number of deaths is going to be above 15,000. 15, okay, so that's a, a very simple uh, question that you know, can be asked by a decision maker and so on. Um, and, and you have, uh, so that, that figure translates in simple probabilistic terms um, uh, uh, an answer to this question. Okay, so here, isolation one, the probability is very small. So it's exactly the same as if you would uh, draw a horizontal line at 15,000 here, and you would see that you know, uh, the, the, there is little chance that uh, under this scenario that the deaths are going to be above 15,000. Okay? But it's just picking a threshold and uh, translating that into a probability. Um, and then, you know, the same is done with, uh, for example, the peak timing. So here again, uh, so on the uh, horizontal axis, you have the, 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 the peak date. So what could be the peak date? And now on the vertical axis, you have uh, the, the scenarios. So for example, the, the, the baseline, the, the, under the baseline scenario, you would expect um, the, the peak of the epidemic, of, you know, here it's of the hospitalization, uh, to peak uh, between, you know, early May to, um, you know, uh, for, let's say for, for during the first three weeks of May. Um, but then, you know, this is translated into uh, a probabilistic outcome. What is the probability that the hospitalization is going, is going to peak beyond May 15th? Okay, so I translate that into a probability. So here it's very unlikely. Okay, so it's about, let's say, I don't know, 15% uh, or something like that. Okay, and same thing with for, for, other, um, for other scenarios. 
Okay, so uh, the models and projection in the report I've, I've just shown you are based on the number of positive tests and also the deaths that are reported. Um, but there were uh, reporting issues and, and there are still reporting issues. Um, so under reporting is not a problem as long as it is done at a constant rate. But um, evidence began to build up that uh, the, 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 the reporting for COVID-19 cases, whether it's for positive tests or to a certain extent death, um, well, were not made at, uh, at the concentrate, rate. And they were biased towards likely positive case. And that came, um, I mean, naturally from the official testing criteria, okay? The, the test, I mean, the, the official guidelines were at the beginning to test only symptomatic, symptomatic individuals who have an history of travel. Uh, then you know, the, the history of travel became less and less relevant and we tested uh, only symptomatic individuals. And well, this is, th these are things that you know, um, we are more or less used to deal with. For example, if we want to uh, work on seasonal influenza, for example. But there was also another thing, which is you know, when you look at the time series of, of reports, um, the, the reporting is inconsistent. And this is a figure I, I pulled uh, from a, a website which uh, has various data on, on, on COVID-19 in Ontario. Uh, we had uh, an inconsistency of, of reporting uh, you know, after, I don't remember exactly the date, but which was you know, April 20th or something like that, where you know, before uh, that date, uh, the number of patients tested was reported. And then after that date, you have the number of samples tested. And so you have the issue of uh, uh, multiple tests on the, on the same person. So, I mean, this slide is just to, to highlight that the model I'm using for forecasting that relies um, nearly exclusively on, 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 on reports of uh, positive tests, it's a bit worrying you know, that to, to rely only on that. So what um, th this issue of, of reporting bias is, is relatively well known and you know, because it's really well, well known, you know, we would like to find uh, a, a way to correct for you know, this testing bias. And in particular, so I've, I've discussed with uh, uh, Kevin Brown, who's uh, an epidemi epidemiologist for uh, Public Health Ontario. He has given a lot of thoughts about it. And here is just my very simple interpretation uh, following some discussion I had with Kevin. and, and Kevin is clearly more advanced on this than I am, but I'm just going to attempt to present the idea because I think it's, it's, it's relatively interesting here. Um, what we want to do is try to adjust for the testing bias. And we, we can represent the data into this, with, with this plot here. So on the horizontal axis, you have the tested proportion. So it's the number of tests um, that is performed every day uh, divided by the total population. So let's say you know, we do 15,000 tests today and we divide by uh, 14 million, which is more or less the, 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 the population of Ontario. And on the vertical axis, you have the positive proportion. So it's the number of positive tests you have on a given day divided by the total number of tests you've done. And so every day you can, you can plot what, what you, uh, your data. So this, these points are uh, symbolized the, the observed data. And what you would like to find is a way, so usually we have a, a very low testing proportion um, with COVID, right? Especially at the beginning. And um, so our understanding is when you have a testing proportion of the whole population, uh, which is very small, it is usually a sign that testing is targeted to individuals that are very likely to be positive. Right? So you have this kind of shape. Here. And as you expand your testing, okay, you broaden your testing criteria, you are going to tend uh, to uh, the true prevalence. Okay? And the, in the extreme case, um, you have, uh, when you reach the proportion uh, 100%, uh, 
you, you, you reach the true proportion, the true prevalence, sorry. But that's difficult because you have um, different process going on here. The, the testing uh, behavior can move around you know, this curve here, and we don't really know what, what curve to use, but what should be this curve. And the, the intrinsic uh, dynamic of, of the epidemics is going to move up and down your true prevalence here. So uh, that, that's really tricky, especially because I'm not sure if we have really the data to disentangle uh, you know, the, 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 the movement from the, the epidemic dynamics from the testing behavior, okay? And when you look at the data, so these are the data I've pulled out from, from four provinces in Canada, it's, it's also puzzling. So you have um, uh, provinces like, for example, Saskatchewan, which is, you know, which has consistently tested, you know, about a thousandth of its, of its population every day. And maybe, you know, this vertical movement is exclusively uh, the result of the epidemic dynamics, okay, this up and down thing. Whereas in Ontario, you see that the, the, the plot, I mean, is, is slightly tilted. So this probably uh, is an indication of testing bias. But really, how to um, you know to 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 find a principal framework to model um, you know testing bias and to fit a curve to that? I don't know. It's it's tricky. I mean, it's definitely a work in progress. But you know, that's the kind of of additional layer that should be added. Uh, you know, when 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 we suspect there is um, a testing bias. Okay, and now to. Um, conclude um, this talk, uh, I'm going to move on to the, uh, to the last part, uh, where I'm going to present another model, uh, which aims to be better adapted to monitor the relaxation phase. So, um, I wish I had more, made more progress uh, by the time I give this talk, uh, but unfortunately it's too, too early for me to share my current results. So, I'm just going to briefly present the conceptual idea. Um, so here, um, the, uh, we have the issues of relying on tests uh, reports only. Uh, we have uh, mounting evidence that asymptomatic infection um, can have a, contribu a significant contribution to the epidemic. And we need to include more reliable data. So the idea is to be based you know, specifically on on hospitalization and death because they are probably less ambiguous and we have now enough data, okay? Unlike in the early phase of the epidemic where we, do, we didn't have a lot of data on death, for example. So the idea is to work backward from, from the death and hospitalization. And this idea is actually made by many other modeling groups um, already. So in the UK, they have done that, I think at, at Imperial, and closer to home, um, you have, for example, my colleagues at, at McMaster who have developed um, their modeling framework that they call McMaster Pandemic, which, which does also that in a, in, a, uh, in a differential equation framework. And my version is, again, with the Renault equation because you know, I find this is uh, relatively convenient to work with. Uh, so the idea here is to shift from forecast only uh, to more like to monitor the relaxation of social distancing, um, try to quantify the potential impact of exist strategies, and also try to uh, quantify the, the testing efforts. So now when I'm talking about testing, I'm talking both about serological testing uh, and the PCR testing that, that needs to be done to you know, understand whether or not you know, relaxation can carry on or we need more uh, retightening of social distancing. So the idea, the basic idea is, is, um, is the following. So when the social distancing measure uh, will start to relax, um, we, we, we want to split the population in two groups. We have the vulnerable group that we, we probably have identified by now who are um, uh, senior citizens. So you know, individuals who are, let's say 60 years old and, and, and more or individuals who have uh, pre-existing uh, medical conditions. And so when the social distancing measures uh, will relax, on the one hand, 
uh, the vulnerable group will be at a higher risk. But on the other hand, uh, you will have herd immunity, which is, which is going to start uh, to build up okay, in, the, in the group of the non-vulnerable population. So ideally, an exit strategy uh, from the general social distancing would um, protect the vulnerable group from new infections and let herd immunity build up among the less at risk uh, population. So, and protecting the vulnerable group aims at keeping the um, health system under their full capacity uh, while building herd immunity buys time until effective pharmaceutical uh, solutions are available. So an effective exit strategy implementation um, depends on a my myriad of factors, but unfortunately we don't have the data to model this strategy in great details. So what I propose here is a high level model to monitor the effectiveness of the exit strategy uh, to achieve uh, the protection um, of vulnerable groups and to monitor also the herd immunity buildup. So this is done with this you know, very simple um, uh, uh, diagram here, where you know, I would try to monitor uh, the force of infection, so the basic reproduction number between all the, the four groups here. So A stands for asymptomatic or mild cases, and C for the severe cases, D for the death and hospitalization. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details because, again, I don't have any results and I, I think I'm running a little bit um, um, out of time. So um, the basic take, take home message for that is it's a switch from forecasting to more monitoring um, uh, the relaxation of social distancing. So to wrap up this talk uh, as a conclusion, um, I think, well, the first point is uh, you know, just to, to show how the renewal equation can be used and how it can be a practical framework for forecasting uh, just incidents, okay, in a relatively simple framework, um, and how it is convenient to add uh, these layers of uh, stochastic um, uh, modeling to translate the uncertainty. Um, also, my experience during this past month was to adapt various models to overcome evolving issues, like you know, the missing data, so that was the latent model, uh, the reporting bias uh, with the, the, the forecasting um, uh, model, the main forecasting model that I used, and then switching to another model which is probably better suited for, um, uh, for monitoring uh, the relaxation of social distancing. And one probably of the key message is that uh, forecast uh, should embrace and propagate uncertainty. Uh, and really we should work with, um, uh, with uh, you know, credible intervals or confidence intervals and so on. Uh, and as you know, the last point uh, of this conclusion is that we are going probably to, to face, uh, you know, relaxation and, and, and retightening of this social distancing cycle. So instead of working with this nice shape, uh, uh, you know, epidemic curve that we are, I mean, most of the modelers in epidemic, uh, epidemic modeling uh, are used to, to work with, we are going to work with, you know, a very uh, bumpy, bumpy road. So we are going to work with an unusual epidemic curve. And the question here is, you know, the, the need to develop modeling tools to adapt to this new situation. And I uh, thank you for your attention and, and I'm open to any question if you have any. Okay, thank you, David. Let's thank David for his wonderful talk. Uh, I, I suggest uh, that have, I... Sorry, sure, uh, John Hong, before you start, I suggest that uh, if you have questions, you type them in the chat and uh, John Hong might uh, moderate the chat so that uh, he can direct questions to the speaker. Uh, some of you will have to leave uh, now. I will have to leave in a few minutes, but uh, the discussion can continue for a few minutes. Uh, so go ahead, John Hong. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to make a comment and have a question. So first of all, I would like to thank you, David, uh, for the talk. And uh, okay. it has been a very uh, pleasant to, 
have received your daily report through the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada's uh, uh, external uh, expert panel. And uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to see somebody is monitoring the whole process uh, for a long time. And also thank you for this is congratulate you for putting this renewal equation stuff that you published with David and uh, Jonathan in the Siam Journal in action. I have a question about your um, behaviors change. So can you actually plot this behavior change be TS variation of time? So if I can plot the data. Can you plug on the BT from the data? Or you set the BT in a particular form, or you can really now, yes. from so, the data, you can really estimate the shape of BT? Yeah, so uh, it's a mix of both. So I fix the shape. So uh, are you still seeing my, my screen, or? Yes. Yeah, okay. yes. So, um, so I, I fix the shape. So I say there is a sudden drop. I fix the date. The only thing I, I uh, I laid free in order to fit that on the data is uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the drop in the contact rate. So to answer your question is I only fit uh, the, the size of the drop. I don't fit the sh anything else than the shape or the date, okay? Everything is fixed except this, this parameter here. Right. Then what about ISO 2 then? ISO 2, it's uh, exactly the same, yes. I have also fixed the, the, the dates here. And at the time when I thought about ISO 2, I, I mean, it was uh, maybe like a few weeks ago. So I just picked these dates. Mm -hmm. But then for the, so because these reports are, are published daily, I, I just want them to be somehow consistent. I was a bit reluctant to change, um, to change the, the dates here. Maybe I shouldn't have, I don't know. But it was just, you know, to, to be consistent day after day, what happens if we, if we go, you know, we start to relax on May 15th. Well, I mean, now, I mean, today we are May 5th. It's, it's relatively clear that, uh, well, we may start to, to relax around in May, but we probably, we are not going to go back to normal by Ju July 15th. I mean, we don't know, but it's probably unlikely. Um, but yeah, so the only thing which is, which is um, fitted on the data is this, uh, the size of the drop. But John Hong, could I ask a quick question before I drop out of the call? Um, yes. Uh, so you, may, you alluded to the fact that uh, you have to choose these various distributions uh, at one point you found was on yeah. and gamma. Yeah. And you just said that there was some uh, question of how those were chosen. Does that make a material difference if you chose other di distributions or are these epidemiologically um, uh, suggested to you? So, uh, it, it, the, the, it's, it's really arbitrary. So really the gamma distribution is for my convenience and also from legacy code I had. Uh, it's not a big deal to change it. Uh, it's just that I, you know, I, I just need to take some time to, to think uh, hard about what, what to choose. Uh, I, I would just point out that um, I've happily uh, switched from, uh, uh, so you no know, incidents here, I mean, you know, from the uh, renewal equation, I was living in a discrete world, but suddenly, you know, I, I, I moved to a, a continuous um, uh, distribution. And that's, and that's okay. I think that's okay, it's, it's not a big deal. And that's what we do anyway with, for example, the, the differential equations. Um, but just to answer more precisely to uh, your, your, your question, all these distribution, uh, I think what, what's gonna make the difference is how uh, uh, the tails of the distribution. For example, the Poisson, here I chose it. It's, again, it's more or less for convenience in the sense that well, I know what the mean should be, but you know, trying to think about the dispersion of, of all these, these uh, distributions, so how, you know, to the extent to the, 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 the amplitude of the noise you want to, to include into your model, it's, I find it very hard to, you know, to fit or, or to fix the value. So here, for example, I fixed the value. Again, it's more for convenience, um, 
And when I try to fit it, it's, it's not fitting to anything. So in a Bayesian framework, uh, I, I, I know my prior and posterior are the same. So it means, you know, I, I, my data are not informative of, of what should be the, 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 uh, the distribution, uh, yes, the, the value. Um, but what I think is if, if you take a distribution that has a fat tails, so, you know, uh, extreme events are possible, then that's going to translate into your forecast. So if, if I would take, I don't know, maybe some kind of a Cauchy distribution with very fat tails, you, know, you may end up with forecasts that are going to, um, uh, so where is it? Uh, with this forecast here, uh, maybe my, my uh, credible intervals would uh, you know, jump to you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, and then that's, that's really a subjective, subjective choice, I, I guess, because somehow if I, if I don't allow the distribution to do that, I'm implicitly not allowing uh, the possibility that we have a lot of death. So you know, it's, it's problematic, it's true. Uh, and that's, that's probably like a, you know, the researcher degree of freedom, as, as we call it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to answer your question, it's, it's subjective and, and definitely we should, I mean, more work should be, should be done in, 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 in choosing this, 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 um, this distribution. Great. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I have to leave the discussion now, but yeah, please continue. Sure. Thank, thank you, Kumar, where you stay. Uh, uh, David, do you still have a few minutes? Yes, I have, yeah. David, yeah, so because uh, there are quite a number of questions, I think uh, it's very important to, to, to get your answers to those questions. And so, um, I think the Public Health Agents Canada is also interested in all the technical details, uh, some people. So the first question is from Christina. Uh, Christina, you want to raise a question by yourself? Um, sure, can you hear me? All right, the question. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I was actually just wondering if you could incorporate subpopulation heterogeneity in your um, your uh, uh, behavior sequencing adherence curve. Um, there is, you know, there, there there have been, I guess, sort of some suggestions that certain groups, you know, will adhere to social distancing because they are able to, and others cannot. Um, and those others that cannot might propagate or, or um, um, reduce the uh, efficacy of control measures. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if it's possible to carve off um, um, or, or subgroup um, populations to model um, the heterogeneity in, in uh, your uh, behavior change as a function of time. Yeah, so um, I think this is, uh, thank you for your question, Christina. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's actually a, a great question because if we want to model, we want to start to model uh, several uh, groups, okay? So um, then we start to reach the limit of uh, the uh, renewal equation framework, okay? So I think that's probably uh, the most re relevant slide to, to answer your question. Um, if, if you have, you know, three, four, five, six, seven subgroups that you want to, uh, to consider into, into the modeling, then I don't think the renewal equation is, is well adapted. Um, you need it, an agent-based model? Well, or, or I mean, it, it depends. I mean, uh, maybe, you know, a compartmental model uh, could, could do the job. I mean, what we have here, uh, I think, in this slide, it, it's a set of tools. And we just have to pick, I mean, as modelers, we have to pick the right set of tools to, to answer whatever question we have. Uh, I, what, what I did, uh, this daily forecast in the early phase of the outbreak, I was, I was really focused on the incidence and, and what I call the, 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 the severity cascade, which is hospitalization, critical case and death. But this cascade actually is a very simple, um, uh, I mean, is estimate, I mean, it's calculated very simply from the incidence. You know, if you remember, I just multiply by, by, by ratio. I put a little bit of noise around that and that's it. So that's okay. Now, if you have, um, if we start to have, so with two groups, so this is this 
conceptual framework I described at the end with the vulnerable group and not the vulnerable group, I can still use the renewal equation, uh, and that's okay. But I wouldn't go beyond three groups with, with the renewal equation. So to answer your question, Christina, I don't, I mean, if you have just two groups, that's okay, I guess. And that's what I'm doing here, and, and it's not too, too, too difficult. But beyond that, I think you start to lose uh, the simplicity appeal of the real equation, and maybe it's time to, to move to another tool. So whether it's an agent-based model or a compartmental, uh, 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 I mean, based on differential equation. But still, I mean, what I emphasize during this talk is I think what's really important is to somehow uh, uh, translate the uncertainty. Okay, so that's more or less possible. I mean, it's, it's possible with, with any, 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 any model, modeling tool. Um, but yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, to your next question to, uh, for Jose Leon, yes, the presentation is, uh, is recorded and it's available. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, you say. Next question from Cornell. Cornell Maklensky from um, your fellow Ray. Klon, are you able to raise your question directly? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, good. David, thank you for the very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, in dealing with the data, do you treat a large region like Ontario as uniformly mixed or break it up into pieces? Like so different locations like London and Toronto, uh, I wonder if they're decoupled now with the social distancing going on. Yes, so I was uh, using, I mean, yes, I was, I consider Ontario as a big uh, one whole population. Um, and I was not, uh, so I was not looking at regional data. Uh, and one reason for that, and I, I didn't even consider it from the beginning. One reason for that is I worked on uh, forecasting seasonal influenza and RSV, so all these seasonal um, acute respiratory infections um, uh, during the uh, 1918, uh, sorry, 2018, 2019 season. And I tried to um, uh, work at, at, the, at the city level, at the region level, and it was very difficult. Uh, I mean, Ontario is, uh, sorry, uh, Toronto is, is really leading most of the numbers for, for, for Ontario. And when you start to look at uh, cities like London and so on, I mean, the data is, I mean, we have a very low count of data and so on, and it's, it's, it was challenging to uh, fit the model. And I'm talking here about influenza. So now with COVID, uh, with all the reporting uh, issues that we had on top compared to, to you know, seasonal influenza, I, I didn't even try. Maybe I should have, but you know, I, it didn't even cross my mind because from my past experience, uh, it was difficult. Just to answer your question, what, I mean, the, the only um, uh, uh, deviation from homogeneity that I included in the model is to use this, um, this exponential um, parameter for the S of M um, depletion uh, factor in, in, the, in the renewal equation. So that's a trick uh, that, I mean, I mean, the whole thing, I mean, the whole um, uh, model was, I mean, inspired, I mean, J Jonathan Dushoff was my uh, supervisor uh, when I was a postdoc at McMaster. And I mean, he came up with the idea and I, and I stole that from him. Um, so, I mean, the whole equation and so on. But, and, and I think that's a nice trick here that we have to um, uh, somehow model very simply and naively uh, contact heterogeneity with this simple um, exponential um, uh, model, if you want. So, and, and that was the only way I, I, you know, naively model heterogeneity in Ontario. And the effect on that, I mean, maybe just to, to conclude on, on this question, the effect on that is to really uh, lower uh, the, the, the number, I mean, the, 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 the intensity of the epidemic. Okay? If you don't have that, if you have alpha equals zero, that means you, know, you implicitly assume that 
everyone in Ontario is, is mixing homogeneously. And then you end up with millions of, of uh, maybe not millions of deaths, but like a huge amount of death, like something which is probably not really realistic. So this, this is why I included this, uh, this parameter here and interpret it into contact heterogeneity. Uh, Jane Hong, I think you are muted, so we can't hear you. Oh, good. So my friend, uh, Masu, you can just raise the hand. So Masu, can you raise the question directly? Professor Yupendiv? Yeah. Yeah. We, you had a, a, a couple of the keywords. So the one was the renewal equation, other was the, the uh, generation uh, uh, interval distribution. But the question is, if you are using the uh, renewal equation, so this is a easy, a, the probabilistic approach is easy to control uncertainty uh, rather than the uh, ODE? I, I don't say, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's easier to control. I mean, in the ODE, you can certainly have your ODE in the stochastic framework. Um, it's, it's just, and again, I mean, um, I, we are dealing with uh, two identical, I mean, we are different framework, but that, lead, that can lead to identical um, uh, uh, epidemic dynamics. So, I, the reason why I'm using the renewal equation is, well, probably first because it's relatively simple to implement, but it's not, I mean, I don't say it's, it's, it's more simple than implementing an ODE. Um, I just say it's, it's, it's relatively simple to implement. It's relatively simple to uh, uh, wrap around some stochasticity as I do here, okay? so. I have my renewal equation that drives uh, the mean of my stochastic process. And I just wrap around that, uh, uh, well here for example, a gamma distribution. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's, it's I, can, I can control it, uh, it's, it's better control than in ODE. I mean, we can certainly, uh, I mean, I'm not too sure what you mean by control, but we can, we, we can do more or less the same in an ODE framework. I just find it more convenient. It's just convenience here. Uh, and also uh, maybe the, uh, the generation interval uh, distribution. So the generation interval distribution is not, is really observable directly. And what I said uh, earlier in the talk is that I make this big assumption, which is probably wrong, that the generation interval is the same as the serial interval, which is the difference mm -hmm. of time between the the, uh, the symptom of set. Uh, but the serial interval is, is much easier to observe and we had early estimates um, uh, for, for, for COVID uh, of the serial interval rather than, I mean, if you go the, the OD uh, route where we have to know the incubation period, we have to know the infectious period. I mean, I would say that, I mean, the, the serial interval is slightly easier to observe uh, than, than the two other distribution. But then it's true that, you know, making the assumption that uh, the generation interval is, is the same as the serial interval is maybe negates this, you know, this convenience of having the serial interval. So you, are think, you are thinking that if you, uh, your approach could give more information on basic reproduction number than the others. So that, yeah. Yes, and it's, it's a direct, I mean, yeah, and that's probably something I should have also emphasized. The, the basic reproduction number here is a parameter of your model. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's directly, I mean, this is, you know, this is here, right? We don't really have to um, try to infer it with, you know, complicated, I mean, we have methods, uh, and I mean, I'm sure like most of, of the people on this call are aware of, you know, how to find you know, the basic reproduction number from the model parameters. But here, it's 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 right here, right? You, you just have it here. So estimating it, it, it's also relatively straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have two more. We have two more questions, and the the, uh, the next is Aaron Sheldon. 
Aaron, you want to raise a question yourself? Uh, no, it's just a, a statement because a, a previous um, uh, audience member asked about the importance of the gamma distributions and their priors. So they uh, they go they vanish in the limit of large numbers. They become uh, degenerate around the actual uh, value of true incidence. Okay, so it's not a question. Thank you. Um, uh, so the the next the last question is from Charles Wong. Charles? Okay, the question from Charles Wong is, it seems that isolation two scenario has not right, much difference in forecasting hospitalization from baseline. Is that correct? The question mark. Uh, yes, yes it is. Because what you do is, so you have this kind of, of pause here, okay, during March uh, 20th until July 15th, but then you go back to normal indefinitely. So, I mean, if you look at, um, uh, so where are the, yeah. So if you look at, at the forecast, so we look at, you know, for example, the death, we see there is not much difference. And uh, in terms of uh, cumulative number of death, let's say, uh, or if we look at hospitalization here, maybe let's look at hospitalization, okay? So there is not much difference. What we've done is when we look at uh, the peak date, the only thing that we've done with this uh, isolation too is that we've just pushed back uh, the peak date by about two months, okay? I mean, under all these assumptions I'm making with the model and so on, that's, that's what's going on here. So uh, isolation two is actually, I mean, intuitively it's doing what you know, we can think it does. It gives a pause uh, to, to to the epidemic. So it's shifting the peak uh, dates forward in time, but it doesn't actually change um, you know, the overall burden. Um, and, I, and I may just add very quickly that actually things are slightly more complicated because um, uh, I'm not fitting the baseline and the isolation um, uh, models the same way um, because the you know, baseline just assumes there is no change. So to fit, I'm fitting them slightly differently. So my explanation is, is a bit simplistic, but, but that's the basic idea. So um, um, I see another question from George and George, uh, uh, that will be the last question. So George? The question is, how do you interpret the mixing parallel for the transmission model? That's actually my question as well. So the homogeneity, uh, how do you interpret the mixing parameter alpha in the transmission model? I think uh, that you yeah. count heterogeneity uh, mixing uh, parameter that Jonas and Dushov uh, uh, discussed with you. Yeah, uh, here it is. Yes. So, so, um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't remember, I'm not too sure if there is a, a particular paper I could point to. Um, there is a publication, but uh, it's, it's, it's just to, um, it's just a trick, basically. I mean, I, I mean the way I'm seeing is just a trick. Maybe there is a, a more, um, there's certainly a more, um, uh, uh, there is a clever interpretation of that. But it's you're you're just changing the rate of depletion. With 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 that, I mean depletion, not depletion. Sorry, the, the way to um, to because this this factor here s over n is decreasing um, uh, from one to to zero, let's say, and you're just changing the rate at which it's decrease for the contact rate only. Okay, because the susceptible depletion is still going on at, you know, at the same rate of, um, of the, the negative incidence. So again, it's more, uh, it's more my interpretation that you, know, you, you, can, you can interpret this parameter as uh, modeling the contact heterogeneity. But again, that's, that's very uh, fuzzy, right? It's very, 
uh, yeah, I wish I had a, a paper. I, I think I, I came across a paper once who explained that better than I'm doing now. Uh, but I think there is in the, in the literature something about that. But I'm sorry. Uh, it, uh, Paul, the Walter paper, I know it's uh, from Richard's model. This is more of ecology and population about a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. It can be empirical model. So, so let me let me uh, uh, conclude here because uh, thank you actually, uh, David, for for a lot of, uh, to entertain all the questions, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us. And uh, again, 